In the summer of 1934, a strange silence descended on San Francisco. Streetcars disappeared, gas stations closed, theater marquees turned off, stores and restaurants locked their doors, butcher shops ran out of meat, the wealthy fled to their country estates. It was as if the city had died. So what led to this extraordinary state of affairs? Well, before I go into that, um, I first of all want to thank Steve Seltzer for inviting me to come here and speak at this Labor Fest event. I want to thank Patrick Marks for hosting this um, and also thank him for keeping independent bookstores alive and well. Um, and they seem to be on the, the comeback, so that's a wonderful thing. Um, and uh, I also want to just say that um, this book, Frisco, um, is a novel that um, I worked on for 15 years. Uh, it was uh, not continuously every day. I had breaks during which I had to do other things. I had other parts of my life that I had to take care of, but it was a long uh, work in progress. Um, I spent a year just doing the research for it. Um, I interviewed a number of people uh, who were longshoremen, who worked on ships, uh, who lived in San Francisco in the 1930s, uh, and uh, I spent, as I say, a year doing the research for it, so long that at one point my wife said to me, are you actually ever going to start writing the novel? <laughs> So uh, I did, obviously, start writing it, and um, it went on for a long time. Um, and what really kept me going through that entire 15 years was the fact that I felt that this was a really important story that had really not been adequately uh, told uh, in fiction. It certainly has... Um, you know, the 1934 Maritime General Strike had been covered in uh, several uh, nonfiction books, but it had never been covered in fiction. And I felt that it was uh, really, I mean, talk about grist for the mill. Um, you know, as a San Francisco historian, uh, and you look back at the important events in San Francisco history, you know, of course, the first things that come to mind are the gold rush and the 1906 earthquake and fire. Um, I would put the 1934 maritime general strike third on that list. As Not first. Okay, you say first. I would say also, though, first in terms of interesting um, for me. Uh, you know, the gold rush was a great event. Uh, brought lots of people here to San Francisco from around the world, from all over the country. Um, but there's no real single narrative that you can sort of grasp onto that I think um, is compelling. And really the same thing with the 1906 earthquake and fire. I mean, it, was, it was at the time the worst natural disaster to ever befall an American city. It was an terrible disaster that, that, that made half the people in the city homeless. Um, but again, there's no single narrative there that involves humans that really is a driving force. Both of those events were sort of driven by these mega forces. The thing I think that makes the, uh, the 1934 Maritime and General Strike so compelling is, one, there is a very single narrative there of, of um, uh, you know, people, especially Harry Bridges, who really came out of obscurity and led uh, this huge um, movement that changed the course of labor history and changed the course of San Francisco labor history and West Coast labor history. Um, uh, so, it, it, in addition, um, what fascinated me about this period was the fact that um, the 1934 maritime strike really became a proxy war for all of these various groups in this area who were vying for the hearts and minds of both the longshoremen and the public at large. And so you see these various groups getting involved in this strike outside of the unions and the ship owners, who obviously were the, the two main uh, protagonists or, or antagonists in the story. But you have, you have 
the Communist Party, which was involved and which was very supportive of the Union and helped, you know, gave them lots of advice. And in fact, there were a lot of the longshoremen who were members of the Communist Party. You had the American Legion, which was a, um, a, a, an organization that was started after World War I with veterans of World War I and had become a very right-wing, super patriotic, you know, racist organization. So those were, you know, the two sort of sides of that. Then you had, you know, the various different unions that already existed here in San Francisco, which were, had various degrees of, um, of, of uh, democracy. In, you know, some of them were, you know, controlled. Uh, some of them were even basically company unions. Other ones were very progressive. Uh, then you had um, the Catholic Church, which was a, a very powerful organization in San Francisco in the 1930s. Something like two-thirds of San Francisco citizens were Catholics in the 1930s. And, you know, primarily from Irish, Italian, French, and other immigrants who came here. So it was a very powerful organization. As a matter of fact, it was said that the Archbishop's Mansion, where the Archbishop lived in that time, um, Edward J. Hanna, it was considered the second city hall. And so, for instance, when the mayor was going to appoint a new fire chief or police chief, he would actually give the list to the archbishop who would, you know, say who he thought was make the best one, that kind of thing. Um, so, and uh, you had the Chamber of Commerce, and then you had the Industrial Association, which was this consortium of large corporations, um, which basically had banded together in the, in the, um, the uh, 19 teens, in the teens, basically to break the unions uh, in order to, you know, give the corporations more power. So, when the strike happened and, you know, eventually shut down the port, and shut down, you know, the ports all up and down the coast. All of these groups were vying for power and control, and I just thought that that was just such an incredibly interesting story. Um, and then I read um, Mike Quinn's book, *The Big Strike*, which may, many of you may have read. Which and Mike Quinn was around and, and, and participated in it, and uh, he was also a journalist, and he just wrote such a great narrative about it. it. You know, to me when I was reading it, it was almost like reading a novel, you know, it was so interesting and exciting and the tension and the, you know, all the power struggles and so forth. So, um, anyway, so that was, uh, all of those things put together uh, really uh, inspired me to tell this story and um, I also, you know, felt an obligation of wanting to tell the story of this strike. Um, to a new generation. Um, uh, there are, uh, you know, I felt with a, 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 a historical novel, and I'm a, a lover of historical novels, um, historical novels can, can tell a story in a way that nonfiction can't. Um, you can get inside people's heads, you can get inside their thoughts, you can, you know, talk about their motivations. Now, one can say certainly some of that is speculative, um, but uh, I really in all of the people who became point of view characters in which I were in their heads, I made just a, you know as much effort as I could to um, make it as true to what I felt was you know honored who they were and what they did. Um, so that kind of narrative is is one in which I felt could grab hold of people both you know of. of older and, and younger generations and keep this story of Harry Bridges and the 1934 general and maritime stri strike alive um, as I say for you know people you know from from here on forward uh, and uh, I think it's great that Labor Fest continues to to do this every year and is also part of this effort to keep this story alive and as well as um, you know all other labor struggles and so forth and being a San Francisco historian and also a, a tour guide, um, another thing that I did with my novel is that I set as many of the scenes as possible in places that existed in 1934 and places that still exist today so that people who read the book and were perhaps interested could then go and visit the various different sites 
that were in the book. And they, they varied everything from the Redstone Building, uh, which was the labor temple at the time, which is where they actually took the vote to, to go out on strike. And, and there's a mural in the lobby of that building. Um, it's what, 16th and Cap Streets. Um, so that you can go there and, and see a mural of what happened there in 1934. And then also places like the Archbishop Mansion, um, the um, Coit Tower, the Garden Court Restaurant, um, the, well, what's called the Boulevard today, the Otter Fred Building, um, the Ferry Building, the Eureka Ferry Boat, which you can still visit today, which was actually doing trips back and forth. So in the back of the book, there is a, um, uh, there is a page called Scene Locations, and it's a list of all of the scenes that are um, in the book that are still exist today that you can go and visit. Um, so, uh, without any further ado, I think I would like to go ahead and read some passages from the book, um, and, um, and then I'll entertain questions after that. So, now this first scene is, um, This first scene is when uh, the ILA is in its infancy in San Francisco. And it was actually started by a fairly conservative fellow by the name of Lee Holman. And, um, but Harry Bridges and his, his um, cohorts were wanting to uh, basically um, steer it in a different direction. And um, so this is, this is actually before the strike starts. <clears throat> Henry Schmidt, and, and just one other thing, most of the book is told in the third person, but one of the characters is, has a journal that he writes in. And so this is actually from his journal. So this is told in the first person, but most of it's in the third person. Henry Schmidt invited me to a victory party at the Albion to celebrate local 3879's election returns. Unlike the subdued atmosphere of my first visit, the beer hall was packed with jubilant dock workers standing three deep at the bar and seated around every table. Lee Holman and his running mates won the offices of president, vice president, and secretary. Unbeknownst to them, however, two-thirds of the elected executive committee are members of a secret slate of candidates, all belonging to the group that meets in Albion Hall above the Albion. Spirited voices and gruff laughter swirled around me as I made way, my way through the boisterous crowd. I spotted Harry Bridges at a table near the back, seated with several others who all seemed to be talking at once, though Bridges didn't appear to share their giddy excitement. Nick, a voice called out, give me a hand. Henry Schmidt stood at the bar, surrounded by longshoremen pressed in around him. He reached over their heads and held out a pair of beer mugs. Pass these over to our table. I took the mugs and handed them to another longshoreman, then passed several more until there was enough beer on the table to serve everyone twice over. Schmidt pushed his way out of the pack and led me to a couple of empty chairs near Bridges. It ain't easy fighting your way through a crowd of muscle-bound stevedores, Schmidt said above the din. Hell, if we can set up picket lines this tough, the shippers don't stand a chance. Everyone laughed, followed by clinking mugs, followed by long, gulping swigs. Dutch Dietrich a stevedore with a trim mustache and a mischievous grin said, We had a set of kegs at every beer. That would convert the blue bookers. Laughter resounded again, although Bridges didn't join in. I asked him if something was wrong. It's too soon, he said. Too soon to celebrate? He nodded. As my ma used to say, don't shout, count your sheep before they're shorn. We got a long way to go before any of this means anything. A jockey can't afford to pat, pat himself on the back if he's ahead at the fourth furlong, furlong, because if he's behind at the tenth, he'll beat himself up. These men have been down so long, they're mistaking a small triumph for a major achievement. they got to understand that we have a long, rocky road ahead. There's going to be ups and downs, and we need to be prepared for every step, or we'll fall flat on our faces. Oh, for Pete's sake, Harry, Schmidt chided. Lighten up. It's good for the men to enjoy their victory. The more they appreciate each other now, the stronger they'll be when the going gets tough. Tell you what, Henry, you worry about morale, and I'll worry about direction, and between the two of us, we'll see if we can keep this fucking sheep afloat. Chip afloat. A what? They clink glasses with gusto, froth and beer spilling on the table. Henry tells me you've got done some writing, Bridges said to me. You know how to use a typewriter? 
I'd mention my journalism experience to Schmidt in hopes it would attract such an inquiry. Perhaps a better question, said Schmidt, is do you know how to fix a typewriter? We've got an old royal that goes on the fritz at least once a day. I'd be happy to take a look at it. I used to fix my dad's typewriter, I lied with a ready expression. The truth is, I can type 60 words a minute, but other than to change ribbons, I've never looked inside a typewriter, much less repaired one. We need writers to help mobilize the men, Bridges said. Interested? Sure, I replied, pleased at how things were developing. With any luck, I'd give Mr. Smith the information he wanted, find the opium on the Diana dollar, and exonerate myself before Christmas. With a beer mug in hand, Henry Schmidt got up and went over to the bar and climbed on top of it. Brothers, he said in a loud voice as he lifted the mug over his head, I salute you. Tonight we celebrate the first step in building a militant fighting union. The men cheered and whistled. And let it be the first of many victories to come. More applause. From this day forward, we are all of one mark, bound together by the justness of our cause, the strength of our will, and the bond of our experience. Again, I say, we are all of one mark. All of one mark, the men repeated, holding their mugs in the air. The room quieted as everyone poured liquid amber down their throats. What does all of one mark mean, I asked Bridges. It's an entire shipload of cargo going to one consignee, so it, doesn't, it isn't divided or broken up because it's all bound for the same destination. Schmidt continued, I want to bring someone up to say a few words. A guy who knows the straight dope and ain't afraid to say it. He beckoned to Bridges. Come on up, Harry. Bridges waved his hand to decline. The men clapped and whistled and cheered until a pair of stevedores grabbed Bridges' arms and lifted him out of his chair. His feet barely touched the floor as he was hustled to the bar and hoisted up on a forest of outstretched arms like the raising of a flagpole. Placed on this high perch, he looked uncomfortable and reserved and glanced shyly at the men below whose faces were flushed from beer and beaming with victory. He stuffed his hands in his coat pockets and began speaking, quietly at first, his eyes lowered as if the sight of 200 enthusiastic stevedores might distract him. There's been a lot of talk about the Blue Eagle and the NRA codes. It's a favorite theme of the conservative union officials who want us to be patient and wait for the government to adopt codes for our industry. They keep telling us to stay calm and don't rock the boat. Just pay our dues and have faith in them like a bunch of fucking sheep. Meanwhile, the government holds NRA rallies and organizes parades all over the country to convince us that every, if everyone adopts the codes, everything will be honky-dory. He lifted his eyes and swept his gaze over the gathering. Do you believe that? No, the men shouted. Damn right, he declared, leaning forward, jutting out his long pointed nose. No working man ever got a fair deal from the government. Why? Because the government's controlled by capital, not labor, and the codes they're proposing will take away our right to strike. Well, let me tell you something. A strike is labor's best weapon. We'd be working 16 hours a day for starvation wages if we waited for the bosses to volunteer concessions. Hell, they'd bottle up the sun and the air if they thought they could make us pay for it. Murmurs of laughter rippled through the room. This seemed to boost Bridges' confidence. He began pacing up and down the bar, making eye ta contact as he spoke. You've heard Capital's favorite phrase, a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. They love to sing it like a well-worn well jingle. But what they don't mention is that wages in the U.S. are down 38%, while corporate dividends are up 160%. So now we know what the bosses mean when they say a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. The men chuckled sardonically. Let me give you another phrase, one that means much more sense for working people. An injury to one is an injury to all. Let me hear you say it. An injury to one is an injury to all, the men chanted. What does it mean? His eyes slowly roved around the room as if he was talking to each man individually. It means that our only chance for a square deal is to stick together. Whether you're a wharf rat or a star gang stevedore, you can't afford to forget your mates. We've got to get organized, form doc committees, build trust among the rank and file so we can call job actions on the spot when the boss speeds things up or ignores hazardous conditions. We can't afford to wait for the codes. Why? He stopped pacing and squared his shoulders toward the men. Because our success depends not on the government, but on ourselves. He resumed stalking back and forth along the bar, continuing in this vein for another ten minutes, his words tumbling out like newsprint from a press. He talked about a democratic union run by and for the rank and file, about an end to payoffs at the shape-up, an end to 40 sack pallets that break apart and rain down on men like cluster bombs. At the end of each point, he punctuated with the question, Roy? And when he did, the men showed their assent with knowing nods. As he described abuses they'd endured and put into words frustrations they felt, a light crept into their eyes and a grin formed on their lips. And as he continued to posit the question, right, they responded in unison, right, their voices infused with hope and tempered by ire. Like everyone else, I was transfixed by his performance. It was pure theater. 
He roamed back and forth, making one point after another, weaving a story that reached deep into the audience, arousing emotions and stoking a fire long dimmed. Someone in the crowd, overcome with emotion, began singing a song that sounded like the battle hymn of the Republic, but with different words. It is we who plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade. Others' voices joined in, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid. Now we stand outcast and starving midst the wonders we have made, but the Union makes us strong. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever. As the second verse began, I studied the voices around me. Some weathered and etched with lines, others smooth and unblemished, yet all of them were staring at bridges with fervent determination, and I had the feeling that I was witnessing the genesis of something historic, a kernel that might grow into something far larger than any of us could imagine. Thank you, thank you. And now, if I can just read one more piece in here. Okay, so this, this particular one is uh, during the general strike. So this is after the general strike has started, following Bloody Thursday and, and all the rest of it. Lillian Benson had never seen anything like it. Has everyone lost their mind? She'd been traipsing from one market to another, and all of them were packed with crazed shoppers as if it were the day before Thanksgiving, and everyone was expecting a horde of hungry relatives. The press had reported the Labor Council's decision to proceed with the general strike on Monday morning and warned of possible shortages. Consequently, shops were enjoying a booming business as residents rushed to stock on what items before the strike began. Lillian noticed other changes as well. Streetcars and taxis had suddenly vanished, presumably when drivers walked out in advance of the other striking unions. And the usual swarm of pedestrians and vehicles along downtown streets was now a slow trickle, giving the city an empty, abandoned atmosphere. Giving up her search for an uncrowded market, she entered Perini's, a family-run grocery store on Columbus Avenue. Like everywhere else, customers were cleaning out the shelves, even of odds and ends like shoe polish. And there was a line snaking up and down the aisles to the checkout counter, which had a sign announcing a five-pound limit on flour and sugar. After enduring the line in Perini's, she went to Ayacopi Meats on Grant Avenue and was disappointed to find the front door locked and a sign in the window announcing it had run out of meat. In desperation, she walked down Grant and ventured into Chinatown, where shoppers crowded the markets. Although this was normal, Chinatown was the densest neighborhood in San Francisco, and every Saturday, Saturday Chinese residents flocked to the stores to buy produce, spices, tea, and rice for the coming week. She found a seafood market on Stockton Street with fresh fish laid out on a bed of ice. Unlike the markets she was used to, this one only stocked whole fish, no fillets or steaks. However, the prices were reasonable. She pointed to a sea bass, as the owner wrapped it in newspaper, she asked for directions to a poultry shop. He shook his head. No speak English. She thought for a moment, then flapped her arms and squawked like a barnyard hen. <laughs> Smiling at her antics, he pointed across the street. The poultry shop was narrow and deep, its walls lined from floor to ceiling with caged birds all clicking and cooing at, cooing at once. The smell of feathers and bird excrement nearly drove Lillian out, but she braced herself, marched up to the counter, and asked for a roasting chicken. The clerk removed a plum, plump hen from one of the cages and presented it for her approval. She nodded and watched as he chopped off its head right in front of her, tore out the gizzards and plucked the feathers as if the whole operation was as normal as brushing his teeth. Taken aback by the sight of blood and guts, she fumbled in her handbag until she found her coin purse to pay for the freshly slaughtered fowl. That evening, she proudly served baked sea brass, scalloped potatoes, and steamed broccoli flavored with salt, pepper, and butter. While Nick, Sarah, and Rune devoured the home-cooked meal, she recounted her shopping adventures and the odd state of things, marking that even during the Great War, food staples hadn't been this scarce. Afterwards, they all gathered in the front parlor for what had become a rare event, a quiet evening at home together. While the radio played in the background, Lillian stitched a needlepoint design, periodically glancing at her father and her two grown children, happy to have them all gathered in one place. Rune was settled in a stuffed mohair chair, puffing contentedly on his meerschaum pipe, his head buried in a newspaper. Nick was on the sofa reading a book, while Sarah sat beside him, staring out the window with a bored expression, as if spending an evening with her family was a burden she was enduring rather than enjoying. The familiar opening strains of the Amos and Andy show came on the radio. 
Lillian had always enjoyed the humorous misadventures of Kingfish, owner of the Fresh Air Taxi Company and his cohorts, and during this difficult times, these difficult times, a bit of laughter was a welcome relief. She reached over to the radio and turned up the volume. Kingfish, ooh-wah, ooh-wah, little queenie, what's that regusting aroma? Show sure smells like the Fresh Air Taxi Company ain't so fresh no more. Needs a good rub down with some sweet lemon oil or something. Madam Queen, looky here, Kingfish, I's wearing my new Odie Colony, Lady of the Cosba. Ain't it odiferous, darling? Kingfish, hmph, in a stage whisper. Brother Crawford, I'm thinking it smell more like the Lady of the Rump Roast. Brother Crawford, yes, sir, Chief, check and double check. Lillian chuckled. Those colored folks sure are a hoot, don't you think? When no one answered, she rested the needlepoint in her lap. Well, don't everyone answer at once. Nick looked up from his book. Mother, those aren't Negroes. They're white actors pretending to be Negroes. Really, she said, resuming her needlepoint. They sure sound colored. Actually, Negroes don't talk like that. Harry Bridges says it makes fun of them in a demeaning way and shouldn't be allowed on the air. Lillian frowned. Harry this, Harry that, if he's so smart, why has he gotten us into this mess? It's bad enough he shut down the city and cleaned out the stores. Now he wants to control the airways? Where will it end? Nick sighed. Drastic situations demand drastic actions. Things will return to normal as soon as the shippers come to there. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program to bring you an emergency address by the mayor of San Francisco, the Honorable Angelo J. Rossi. Lillian stopped mid-stitch and stared pensively at the radio. My fellow citizens, in saying to you that all of us tonight face a situation of great seriousness and difficulty, I wish also to remind you that San Francisco before now has come triumphantly through great disasters. However, this current state of emergency is like none other we've faced before, and tonight I ask all our citizens to pull together in this uncertain hour and stand up for the liberties and freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution. Lillian dropped her needlepoint. State of emergency. What does he mean? What does he intend to do?